Chapter Four of She. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Icy Jumbo. She by H. Rider Haggard. Chapter Four The Squall. How different is the scene that I now have to tell from that which has just been told! Gone are the quiet college rooms, gone the wind-swayed English elms, the cawing rooks, and the familiar volumes on the shelves, and in their place there rises a vision of the great calm ocean gleaming in shaded silver lights beneath the beams of the full African moon. A gentle breeze fills the huge sail of our dhow and draws us through the water that ripples musically against her sides. Most of the men are sleeping forward, for it is near midnight, but a stout swarthy Arab, Mohammed by name, stands at the tiller, lazily steering by the stars. Three miles or more to our starboard is a low, dim line. It is the eastern shore of Central Africa. We are running to the southward, before the northeast monsoon, between the mainland and the reef that for hundreds of miles fringes this perilous coast. The night is quiet, so quiet that a whisper can be heard fore and aft the dhow, so quiet that a faint booming sound rolls across the water to us from the distant land. The Arab at the tiller holds up his hand and says one word, Simba, lion. We all sit up and listen. Then it comes again a slow, majestic sound that thrills us to the marrow. To-morrow, by ten o'clock, I say, we ought, if the captain is not out in his reckoning, which I think very probable, to make this mysterious rock with a man's head, and begin our shooting. And begin our search for the ruined city and the fire of life, corrected Leo, taking his pipe from his mouth and laughing a little. Nonsense, I answered. You were airing your Arabic with that man at the tiller this afternoon. What did he tell you? He has been trading, slave-trading probably, up and down these latitudes for half his iniquitous life, and once landed on this very man-rock. Did he ever hear anything of the ruined city or the caves? No, answered Leo. He says that the country is all swamp behind, and full of snakes, especially pythons and game, and that no man lives there. But then there is a belt of swamp all along the East African coast, so that does not go for much. Yes, I said, it does. It goes for malaria. You see what sort of an opinion these gentry have of the country? Not one of them will go with us. They think that we are mad, and upon my word I believe that they are right. If we ever see old England again I shall be astonished. However, it does not greatly matter to me at my age, but I am anxious for you, Leo, and for Job. It's a Tom Fool's business, my boy. All right, Uncle Horace. So far as I am concerned, I am willing to take my chance. Look, what is that cloud? And he pointed to a dark blotch upon the starry sky, some miles astern of us. Go and ask the man at the tiller, I said. He rose, stretched his arms, and went. Presently he returned. He says it is a squall, but it will pass far on one side of us. Just then Job came up, looking very stout and English in his shooting suit of brown flannel, and with the sort of perplexed appearance upon his honest round face that had been very common with him since he got into these strange waters. "'Please, sir,' he said, touching his sun-hat, which was stuck on the back of his head in a somewhat ludicrous fashion, "'as we have got all these guns and things in the whale-boat astern, to say nothing of the provisions in the lockers, I think it would be best if I got down and slept in her.' I don't like the looks, here he dropped his voice to a portentous whisper, of these black gentry. They have such a wonderful thievish way about them. Supposing now that some of them were to slip into the boat at night and cut the cable and make off with her, that would be a pretty go, that would. The whale-boat, I may explain, was one specially built for us at Dundee in Scotland. We had brought it with us, as we knew that this coast was a network of creeks, and that we might require something to navigate them with. She was a beautiful boat, thirty feet in length, with a centreboard for sailing, copper-bottomed to keep the worm out of her, and full of watertight compartments. 
The captain of the Dow had told us that when we reached the rock, which he knew, and which appeared to be identical with the one described upon the shirt, and by Leo's father, he would probably not be able to run up to it on account of the shallows and breakers. Therefore we had employed three hours that very morning, whilst we were totally becalmed, the wind having dropped at sunrise, in transferring most of our goods and chattels to the whale-boat, and placing the guns, ammunition, and preserved provisions in the watertight lockers specially prepared for them, so that when we did sight the fabled rock we should have nothing to do but step into the boat and run her ashore. Another reason that had induced us to take this precautionary step was that Arab captains are apt to run past the point that they are making, either from carelessness or owing to a mistake in its identity. Now as sailors know, it is quite impossible for a dhow, which is only rigged to run before the monsoon, to beat back against it. Therefore we got our boat ready to row for the rock at any moment. "'Well, Job,' I said, "'perhaps it would be as well. There are lots of blankets there. Only be careful to keep out of the moon, or it may turn your head, or blind you.' "'Lord, sir, I don't think it would much matter if it did. It is that turned already with the sight of these blackamoors and their filthy thieving ways. They are only fit for muck, they are, and they smell bad enough for it already.' Job it will be perceived, was no admirer of the manners and customs of our dark-skinned brothers. Accordingly we hauled up the boat by the tow-rope till it was right under the stern of the dhow, and Job bundled into her with all the grace of a falling sack of potatoes. Then we returned, and sat down on the deck again, and smoked and talked in little gusts and jerks. The night was so lovely, and our brains were so full of suppressed excitement of one sort and another, that we did not feel inclined to turn in. For nearly an hour we sat thus, and then, I think, we both dozed off. At least I have a faint recollection of Leo sleepily explaining that the head was not a bad place to hit a buffalo, if you could catch him exactly between the horns, or send your bullet down his throat, or some nonsense of the sort. Then I remember no more, till suddenly a frightful roar of wind, a shriek of terror from the awakening crew, and a whip-like sting of water in our faces. Some of the men ran to let go the haul-yards and lower the sail, but the parrel jammed, and the yard would not come down. I sprang to my feet and hung on to a rope. The sky aft was dark as pitch, but the moon still shone brightly ahead of us and lit up the blackness. Beneath its sheen a huge white-topped breaker, twenty feet high or more, was rushing on to us. It was on the break, the moon shone on its crest and tipped its foam with light. On it rushed, beneath the inky sky, driven by the awful squall behind it. Suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, I saw the black shape of the whale-boat cast high into the air on the crest of the breaking wave. Then a shock of water, a wild rush of boiling foam, and I was clinging for my life to the shroud. I swept straight out from it like a flag in a gale. We were pooped. The wave passed. It seemed to me that I was under water for minutes. Really, it was seconds. I looked forward. The blast had torn out the great sail, and high in the air it was fluttering away to leeward like a huge wounded bird. Then for a moment there was comparative calm, and in it I heard Job's voice yelling wildly, "'Come here to the boat!' Bewildered and half-drowned as I was, I had the sense to rush aft. I felt the dhow sinking under me. She was full of water. Under her counter the whale-boat was tossing furiously, and I saw the Arab Mohammed, who had been steering, leap into her. I gave one desperate pull at the tow-rope to bring the boat alongside. Wildly I sprang also. Job caught me by the arm, and I rolled into the bottom of the boat. Down went the dhow bodily, and as she did so Mohammed drew his curved knife and severed the fibre-rope by which we were fast to her, and in another second we were driving before the storm over the place where the dhow had been. "'Great God!' I shrieked. "'Where is Leo? Leo! Leo! "'He's gone, sir! God help him!' roared Job into my ear, and such was the fury of the squall that his voice sounded like a whisper. I wrung my hands in agony. Leo was drowned, and I was left alive to mourn him. "'Look out!' yelled Job. "'Here comes another!' I turned. 
A second huge wave was overtaking us. I half hoped that it would drown me. With a curious fascination I watched its awful advent. The moon was nearly hidden now by the wreaths of the rushing storm, but a little light still caught the crest of the devouring breaker. There was something dark on it, a piece of wreckage. It was on us now, and the boat was nearly full of water. But she was built in airtight compartments, heaven bless the man who invented them, and lifted up through it like a swan. Through the foam and turmoil I saw the black thing on the wave hurrying right at me. I put out my right arm to ward it from me, and my hand closed on another arm, the wrist of which my fingers gripped like a vice. I am a very strong man, and had something to hold on to, but my arm was nearly torn from its socket by the strain and weight of the floating body. Had the rush lasted another two seconds I might either have let go or gone with it, but it passed, leaving us up to our knees in water. "'Bail out! Bail out!' shouted Job, suiting the action to the word. But I could not bail just then, for as the moon went out and left us in total darkness, one faint flying ray of light lit upon the face of the man I had gripped, who was now half lying, half floating in the bottom of the boat. It was Leo. Leo brought back by the wave, back, dead or alive, from the very jaws of death. "'Bail out! Bail out!' yelled Job. "'Or we shall founder!' I seized a large tin bowl with a handle to it, which was fixed under one of the seats and the three of us bailed away for dear life. The furious tempest drove over and round us, flinging the boat this way and that, the wind and the storm wreaths and the sheets of stinging spray blinded and bewildered us, but through it all we worked like demons with the wild exhilaration of despair, for even despair can exhilarate. One minute, three minutes, six minutes, the boat began to lighten, and no fresh wave swamped us. Five minutes more, and she was fairly clear. Then, suddenly, after the awful shriekings of the hurricane, came a duller, deeper roar. Great heavens! It was the voice of breakers! At that moment the moon began to shine forth again, this time behind the path of the squall. Out far across the torn bosom of the ocean shot the ragged arrows of her light, and there, half a mile ahead of us, was a white line of foam then a little space of open mouth to blackness, and then another line of white. It was the breakers, and their roar grew clearer and yet more clear as we sped down upon them like a swallow. There they were, boiling up in snowy spouts of spray, smiting and gnashing together like the gleaming teeth of hell. "'Take the tiller, Mohammed," I roared in Arabic. "'We must try and shoot them.' At the same moment I seized an oar and got it out, motioning Job to do likewise. Mohammed clambered aft, and got hold of the tiller, and with some difficulty Job, who had sometimes pulled a tub upon the homely cam, got out his oar. In another minute the boat's head was straight on to the ever-nearing foam, towards which she plunged and tore with the speed of a racehorse. Just in front of us the first line of breakers seemed a little thinner to the right or left. There was a cap of rather deeper water. I turned and pointed to it. "'Steer for your life, Mohammed!' I yelled. He was a skilful steersman, and well acquainted with the dangers of this most perilous coast, and I saw him grip the tiller, bend his heavy frame forward, and stare at the foaming terror till his big round eyes looked as though they would start out of his head. The send of the sea was driving the boat's head round to starboard. If we struck the line of breakers fifty yards to starboard of the gap, we must sink. It was a great field of twisting, spouting waves. Mohammed planted his foot against the seat before him, and glancing at him I saw his brown toes spread out like a hand with the weight he put upon them as he took the strain of the tiller. She came round a bit, but not enough. I roared to Job to back water, whilst I dragged and laboured at my oar. She answered now, and none too soon. Heavens! We were in them! and then followed a couple of minutes of heartbreaking excitement such as I cannot hope to describe. All that I remember is a shrieking sea of foam, out of which the billows rose, here, there, and everywhere, like avenging ghosts from their ocean grave. Once we were turned right round, 
but either by chance or through Mohammed's skilful steering, the boat's head came straight again before a break of Fildus. One more, a monster! We were through it or over it, more through than over, and then, with a wild yell of exultation from the Arab, we shot out into the comparative smooth water of the mouth of sea between the teeth-like lines of gnashing waves. But we were nearly full of water again, and not more than half a mile ahead was the second line of breakers. Again we set to, and bailed furiously. Fortunately the storm had now quite gone by, and the moon shone brightly, revealing a rocky headland running half a mile or more out into the sea, of which this second line of breakers appeared to be a continuation. At any rate they boiled around its foot. Probably the ridge that formed the headland ran out into the ocean, only at a lower level, and made the reef also. This headland was terminated by a curious peak that seemed not to be more than a mile away from us. Just as we got the boat pretty clear for the second time, Leo, to my immense relief, opened his eyes and remarked that the clothes had tumbled off the bed, and that he supposed it was time to get up for chapel. I told him to shut his eyes and keep quiet, which he did without in the slightest degree realising the position. As for myself, his reference to chapel made me reflect, with a sort of sick longing, on my comfortable rooms at Cambridge. Why had I been such a fool as to leave them? This is a reflection that has several times recurred to me since, and with an ever-increasing force. But now again we were drifting down on the breakers, though with lessened speed, for the wind had fallen, and only the current or the tide, it afterwards turned out to be the tide, was driving us. Another minute, and with a sort of howl to Allah from the Arab, a pious ejaculation from myself, and something that was not pious from Job, we were in them, and then the whole scene, down to our final escape, repeated itself, only not quite so violently. Mohammed's skilful steering and the airtight compartments saved our lives. In five minutes we were through, and drifting, for we were too exhausted to do anything to help ourselves except keep our head straight, with the most startling rapidity round the headland which I have described. Round we went with the tide, until we got well under the lee of the point, and then suddenly the speed slackened, we ceased to make way, and finally appeared to be in dead water. The storm had entirely passed, leaving a clean-washed sky behind it. The headland intercepted the heavy sea that had been occasioned by the squall, and the tide, which had been running so fiercely up the river, for we were now in the mouth of a river, was sluggish before it turned, so we floated quietly, and before the moon went down managed to bail out the boat thoroughly and get her a little shipshape. Leo was sleeping profoundly, and on the whole I thought it wise not to wake him. It was true he was sleeping in wet clothes, but the night was now so warm that I thought, and so did Job, that they were not likely to injure a man of his unusually vigorous constitution. Besides, we had no dry ones at hand. Presently the moon went down, and left us floating on the waters, now only heaving like some troubled woman's breast, with leisure to reflect upon all that we had gone through, and all that we had escaped. Job stationed himself at the bow, Mohammed kept his post at the tiller, and I sat on a seat in the middle of the boat, close to where Leo was lying. The moon went slowly down in chastened loveliness. She departed like some sweet bride into her chamber, and long veil-like shadows crept up the sky through which the stars peeped shyly out. Soon, however, they too began to pale before a splendour in the east, and then the quivering footsteps of the dawn came rushing across the new-born blue, and shook the high stars from their places. Quieter and yet more quiet grew the sea, quiet as the soft mist that brooded on her bosom and covered up her troubling, as the elusive wreaths of sleep brood upon a pain-racked mind, causing it to forget its sorrow. From the east to the west sped the angels of the dawn, from sea to sea, from mountain-top to mountain-top, scattering light with both their hands. On they sped, out of the darkness, perfect, glorious, like spirits of the just breaking from the tomb. On, over the quiet sea, over the low coastline, and the swamps beyond, and the mountains above them. 
over those who slept in peace and those who woke in sorrow, over the evil and the good, over the living and the dead, over the wide world and all that breathes or has breathed thereon. It was a wonderfully beautiful sight, and yet sad, perhaps, from the very excess of its beauty. The arising sun, the setting sun. There we have the symbol and the type of humanity, and all things with which humanity has to do. The symbol and the type, yes, and the earthly beginning and the end also. And on that morning this came home to me with a peculiar force. The sun that rose today for us had set last night for eighteen of our fellow voyagers, had set everlastingly for eighteen whom we knew. The Tao had gone down with them. They were tossing about among the rocks and seaweed, so much human drift on the great ocean of death. And we four were saved. But one day a sunrise will come when we shall be among those who are lost, and then others will watch those glorious rays, and grow sad in the midst of the beauty, and dream of death in the full glow of a rising life. For this is the lot of man. End of chapter 4